You're listening to international investment advisor Doug Goldstein on the Goldstein on Gelt Show, the financial show where we'll talk about how you can make the most of your money. With all the confusing financial chatter bombarding you each and every day, Goldstein on Gelt will give you the practical information you want and need about living a financially stable life. Here's your host, money maven Doug Goldstein. Okay, we are back. I'm very happy to have on the show Michael Starbird, who is a math professor at the University of Texas at Austin, and occasionally he's a visiting member of the Institute for Advanced Study in Princeton. Michael, a pleasure to have you. Well, it's my, my pleasure to be here. In fact, I think you and I have a, a great deal in common because my brother, David Goldstein, is also a professor at UT, and he spent a lot of time at Princeton as well, and I, I think he was at the uh, Jet Propulsion Laboratory in Pasadena when he was at Caltech, so I feel like we're brothers already. <laughs> Sounds great, yes. So, I enjoyed all those places. <laughs> so congratulations on your book, The Five Elements of Effective Thinking, which you wrote with uh, Edward Berger. In the book, you give the tools that people need for practical decisions. My question is, in, in, in real life, when people have to make real practical decisions related to their money, which is such an emotional issue, how can they Im improve in that? Well, yeah, it's interesting. We wrote this book, uh, Five Elements of Effective Thinking, with the idea of trying to get to the essence of what kind of strategies a real person can use to make better decisions. And in the case of, of dealing with money, one of the most fundamental questions that I always ask is, what is the real question? And this is a really basic question, meaning, for example, is making more money the real goal of what you're after? Or is it that you want to get something from the money? And is it possible that just making more money is not the right avenue to getting what it is that you're actually uh, seeking. Well, that's exactly what I say to my clients. When people come in, my day job is that I'm an investment advisor. I only do the radio gig once a week. I get clients that they come in and they say, you know, Doug, I'd like to make a million dollars. And when we begin talking, it's really that they just want to feel secure that they'll be able to retire one day. And the yeah. amount of money is not the main issue. Right. Ab absolutely. And, and that... To me, that's one of the essential questions is just asking, what is the real question? And, and that can guide all kinds of things from individual decisions about, for example, investments in financial uh, matters or in life, ma life matters themselves. But what's sort of surprising to my co-author and, and me about this is that we actually use these techniques ourselves in everyday life. <laughs> if we're teaching a class, you know, and we're trying to say, well, can, can we really get the students to understand better the, what's happening? Then sure enough, we use these methods. Okay, so let's, let's focus a little more on this topic. When someone wants to figure out what the real question is, he's probably actually blinded by what he thinks the real question is. How do you make that paradigm switch? Yeah, that, of course, this is the real challenge. All of us are biased. And, and we have to just, first of all, accept the fact that all of us are living in the, the parable of the emperor's new clothes. Mm -hmm. Is this a parable that is familiar to you? And oh, absolutely. We live yeah. it every day. Yeah, exactly. And I think we all live it. I think the reality is that we all see things that aren't there. We see things that we've been taught over many years to, to believe is the way that we should view the world. And then the question is, how can we overcome that? How can we uh, sort of uh, force ourselves to see the world more clearly? And I think that there are several uh, important ways to do that. One thing, first of all, is to just ask that question. You know, ask, what is the real question? But another kind of way to, to ask it is, is to force yourself to, to challenge your opinions. And here's, here's a question that I, I was uh, asking a, a class of mine that I, I gave a lecture to yesterday, which was the, asking the question, what were they thinking? Mm -hmm. Ask yourself, you look back 50 years or 100 years or 150 years, and you can see attitudes that people had in the world that we now view as completely inappropriate. For example, slavery was a common thing here in the south of, of the United States. Mm -hmm. It wasn't that every single person was a rotten, immoral person. It's that that was the way people believed the world was and that it was okay to be behave that way. 
Well, it's easy to look back 100 years and see what, what people were sort of uh, strange at or immoral or otherwise defective in their opinions. But how about asking the question in 50 years from now? What are people going to say about us? I think your, your model goes back all the way to the Bible when Abraham said, you know, I don't think that there are idols that are really gods and there's only one God. And he questioned what was the general knowledge then. Right. And, and of course, the, the religious biases are, of course, some of the most uh, important and insidious in creating a world that is potentially peaceful and global. And these kinds of biases that we're all brought up with and are important aspects of our own lives. And they're the hardest ones for us to, to give up and to be open-minded about. It's funny that you ask these questions as a math professor. Do you actually teach math as well? <laughs> I do actually teach mathematics. But I'll tell you, it's interesting about mathematics. One of the things in teaching mathematics is to realize that that there are opinions about mathematics themselves uh, that 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 people have that are sort of strange that if i have students coming in particularly beginning students um they will have misconceptions about basic things like the real numbers mm -hmm. or numbers that are, are are sort of interesting it's not correct that that you have a perfect understanding of numbers and then you develop further deeper mathematical ideas what really happens is that you develop further in any subject and then you can go back and you can revisit the fundamentals and see them anew and differently. So that happens even in mathematics. Okay, we are talking to Michael Starbird, who's a professor of mathematics at the University of Texas at Austin. Michael, you, you came out with a book recently, and in your book, the book called The Five Elements of Effective Thinking, you, you teach this concept about how people can understand simple things deeply. And based on what you were saying a minute ago, I. I, I'm wondering how people can really do that. You're saying you got to just ask yourself the question, what else can we do to begin to understand our simple day-to-day -day life questions like, should I buy this? Should I invest in that stock? How's my budget? How can I look at that more deeply? Well, okay, so, so let, let me think about the uh, uh, investment implications. So one, one thing that I would say is to say, Ha, do you really have you really mastered the fundamentals of what it is that you're after? And, and we talked about this a little bit before, meaning what actually gives satisfaction to your life? And are you spending the money and making the money and uh, and using your resources to best advantage? For example, I, I know that that some people will buy a large house and live in the suburbs of a big city and spend 45 minutes commuting to go downtown to get to work in order to make enough money to support the house out, out in the suburbs. Okay. And it may very well be that if they lived closer to their work and had a, a, a less fancy house and spent less time in the annoying traffic that they made <laughs> single day, they actually have a happier life. And so deciding on your own way of, of spending money, I think asking the basic question, what satisfaction do I get from a particular either income generating uh, decision or a spending decision? And, and it's just amazing to me how those kinds of decisions can lead to choices. For example, how much time do you work? Is it important to o overwork here in the United States? Of course, I don't know what it's like in Israel, but, but successful people are often rather proud of overworking. Right, right. right? It's, it's a whole culture, sure. And, and then you have to ask yourself, well, at the end of the day, is it really true that a person has gotten more satisfaction by being so busy that they don't have time to visit with their friends? Is that a good trade-off. So that, that's one of the simple things you're describing. You're saying the way to understand it more deeply is simply to ask yourself these types of questions? Absolutely. Absolutely. So, so as an investment advisor, I find that people, with all due respect to the many, many, many people I speak to, they, they seem incapable of asking themselves these questions. And I always feel, frankly, that I'm the one who's stepping in. That's what they, it's a big part of what they pay me for, is just to, to ask them what their real goals are, to help them work, work that out. 
Absolutely. Absolutely. And I, and I think that, that I mean, I, I love the fact that you are, are um, saying that that is what you view as your, your goal. I think it's very often the case that the real work that we do may be somewhat different from the description on the door. Sure. It's, it's, that, it's that and being a marriage counselor. Those are the two things that I do as a financial planner. <laughs> exactly correct. Exactly correct. And that's not bad. That's actually absolutely correct and the, the right way to look at it, that when we go through life, I mean, all of us really make decisions about life. We're talking about very important fundamental issues about the satisfaction of life. And we, we all go through this experience, which we don't, any of us, understand completely. And I think it's just more intriguing if we're constantly asking ourselves these very fundamental questions. Because it opens up doors. It's, it's, first of all, it's just much more interesting to be asking ourselves the fundamental question, what is life really about? And my own personal life, not, not big global questions about the you know, beginning of time, but how do I spend my day and my week? I mean, to me, that's a, a very basic thing. Uh, let me give you one more example, if you don't sure. mind. Um, so about traffic, back to traffic. I don't know why traffic has come to my mind, except I just drove <laughs> from home. But I'll tell you, I enjoyed my driving from home, and I'll tell you why. Because I have a solution to traffic, which is okay. that in the car, I always listen to either books on tape or to uh, lectures and these are fascinating. I'm listening to lectures about World War II, and it's just fascinating. And so I have listened to incredible amounts of wonderful literature and books and, and lectures so that I actually go home. Sometimes I choose to go home during rush hour. <laughs> All right. The Greens won't be so happy with that because they use a lot of gas, but I, I fully understand. Sometimes I'll sit in my car when I get home just to listen to the end of whatever exactly, exactly. Whatever I was listening. That is very interesting. We're talking to Michael Starbird as a professor of math, although it might be hard to tell from the discussion we've had. Uh, Michael, we're, we're actually running close uh, to the end of our time, but I want to ask you something you've mentioned on other occasions and in your book about this concept of creativity and insightfulness. These are so critical. These tools are critical to have in order to become a deeper thinker like you were describing. Have you successfully taught people this and have they successfully learned it? Absolutely. Uh, there, there's a myth that, that, in, uh, that uh, creativity is really a matter of magical inspiration and just sort of magic. And, and that's just completely wrong. And it's wrong for two reasons. One is that it's just factually wrong. <laughs> and two is useless. If you think that creativity and innovation are just things that happen by magic, there's nothing to do. And so what our book is and uh, it talks about our five elements of effective thinking is that there's sort of a checklist of, of actual strategies that you can undertake that lead to insights and new ideas and such as thinking about what the basic questions are and making mistakes. That's a huge one. Making mistakes, not avoiding mistakes, making the mistakes so that you can see where that mistake leads you and raising the right kinds of questions, seeing the flow of ideas. These, there are specific strategies that lead to innovation. That's the difference between the brilliant person, between the person who comes up with innovative ideas that we refer to as ideas of genius. The difference isn't really that they were born with the word genius written on their, you know, tattooed to their arm. It's that they got in the habit of using their minds in these very practical ways that lead to new ideas. Okay, that sounds like uh, something that's very useful. We're just about out of time, so tell me in the last few seconds, how can people actually find out more about what you're doing? Well, well, we've written a book called The Five Elements of Effective Thinking, we being uh, my co-author Edward Berger and uh, myself. Uh, there's a website. You can just look up the uh, Elements of Effective Thinking and uh, just just go to Amazon.com or anywhere and find uh, find the book. That would be a good start. It's very short. It's it's uh, we worked extremely hard to make it very short and easy to read, but hopefully uh, pro thought provoking and inspirational. Okay, Michael Starbird from the University of Texas and the author of the Five Elements of Effective Thinking. Thanks so much for your time. Thank you. You've been listening to the Goldstein on Gelt Show with money maven Doug Goldstein. 
Doug's weekly radio show is heard around the world. But if you miss it, you can download the podcast at www.goldsteinongelt.com. The Goldstein on Gelt Show gives you up-to-date financial ideas so you can get on the path to financial freedom. If you'd like your questions answered on the air or off, send Doug an email to doug at profile-financial.com. It's your money for your future, so join Doug every week to build your wealth on the Goldstein on Gelt Show.